Welcome back to the Donkey Kong Country playthrough. In this part, Rolling Ice Monkeys. What we got to talk about in this one, mate, besides, you know, the aforementioned Rolling Monkeys. Well, I guess we could talk about Rare and really its relationship with Nintendo. Mm -hmm. um, Rare was one of the first Western developers to that was able to develop for Nintendo. Like, at this point, it's not that unheard of. Like, Retro Studio makes the made the Metroid Prime trilogy and later would go on to make the Donkey Kong Country Return series. Uh -huh. So it's not that unheard of. But back then in the 80s and 90s, because a lot of people know that Rare made this game, but a lot of people don't know that Rare's relationship with Nintendo dates all the way back to the NES. They were making tons of games back then and also on the Game Boy. It was Donkey Kong Country that they were, you know, allowed to completely just make their own game. And, of course, it became the big popular one. Mm -hmm. Just before you continue with your trivia, I want to blow your mind. Did you know that Rare developed Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Yes, I actually kind of did. Well, damn, there goes the wind from my metaphorical sails. Please, continue. It's actually pretty good, though, because, you know, we did commentate over that movie, so it all works together. I wouldn't have brought it up, but thanks. <laughs> it's like poetry, it rhymes. Sorry, that giant golden thing kind of took me by surprise. Yeah, the golden froggy. Also, at the end of this, I don't know how many lives I got. I It's cut off. But if you listen to the count, I got nine. Jesus, game designers, get together. I know it took forever to render all these graphics. It's hilarious when you listen to the interviews, because they had to render the 3D models before they got digitized. Uh -huh. They talk about how they had to work until like 11 at night. And then they would render the model, leave it overnight rendering, and then when they would come back to work the next morning, it wouldn't be done. It's like, wow, I've been there, but with gameplay footage videos. Yeah, that sounds like Pixar tier kind of rendering times. Well, it was new. Uh, not a lot of people were using the silicon graphics, but after this, they got used for a while, and then they kind of went bankrupt. Which is sad. Speaking of, like, next year, it will be the 20th anniversary of Toy Story. How crazy is that? And now I'm old. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm older than you, mate, so uh, don't try playing that card. Yeah, true, true, true. Okay, so uh, I think we should, like, dispel a myth, perhaps. Um, you got any news about Miyamoto and Rare's working relationship? Yeah, there's... I don't know how this got started. Well, it got started by one Miyamoto doing an interview where he claimed that Donkey Kong Country's gameplay was either mediocre or shallow. He described it in not the nicest of terms which i have to wholeheartedly disagree i mean if you want to compare like the actual physics graphics of this game they there is at least five more layers to it than you can put over super mario world mm -hmm. but by saying that it was mediocre and that the focus was more on the graphical fidelity and the cool 3d models a lot of people got the impression that miyamoto hates donkey kong country no no which is not true when it was being developed miyamoto corresponded with uh, I believe it was Tim Stamper who was directing this game. He corresponded with him on a daily basis with emails and then of course, you know, they didn't re really meet in person until Stamper went to Japan which couldn't be that frequently. Yeah. But when he did, it was usually to get he would present what they have so far. The people at Nintendo would say, this is good. You may need to change this. And what happened was Miyamoto was on that board too. He was giving constant feedback throughout the development of the game. Donkey Kong's hand slam? That's Miyamoto's idea. Well, praise be to he that helped me pass the 100-man mellow. <laughs> so it may just be that Donkey Kong Country is not a game that he would have made his way. But it's in no way, in no way implies that he hates it. They're two different games, and they both work on different levels. You have to remember that uh, Nintendo is a Japanese development company. They have different philosophies and whatnot to uh, Western companies. I, I want to say more, in more like inclusive or exclusive, I think would be the better word, is that right? And that was another thing, too, with this game, was when the game was pretty much almost done, this was probably even the same meeting that they pitched the hand slap. The hand slap was pitched, like, three weeks before the game was supposed to go out. It was last second. Mm. But one of the, the development things that they told them to do was they believed that the difficulty was too high originally. Which, there you go, Nintendo was casualizing even with the SNES. They were trying to reach a broader audience even back then. They said that the actual levels themselves, the difficulty should be toned down a little bit, in that the hardcore gamer would receive enough 
um, like they would be satisfied with finding all the bonus stages, which some of these bonus stages are hidden in really weird ways, and some of them do require advanced techniques like the super jump. And I think it's a pretty good balance, because even the regular levels, by the time you get to World 5, World 6, they still have a huge amount of difficulty. I have to kind of laugh <laughs> at the idea of them casualizing this, because I would rank Donkey Kong Country 2 as like the hardest in the trilogy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, like I said, everything that Donkey Kong Country was, Donkey Kong Country to me, is bigger and better, and that also includes the difficulty curve. Probably where the uh, the urban legend of Miyamoto upending tea tables came from, this whole Donkey Kong for all, because I know there was a, a bit of a ordeal with uh, Paper Mario Sticker Star, and I think there, it, it was something about, like, people in some kind of survey saying that they didn't really like the story of, like, Super Paper Mario, or they voted, like, the story as the least important aspect, and he's like, oh, I guess they don't care for it. Take it out of stickers, though. Focus groups ruin video games. That is what ruined Epic Mickey. Ugh. No, did you, you remember the old concept art that was, like, all kind of spooky and you had the scary robo-goof? Well, that was, I think, just kind of like a pre-concept kind of thing. The actual things that got taken out were, like, a scrapper Mickey and so on. I know, because that scared focus groups, but... H have these people never watched Runaway Brain and stuff like that? Mickey, like, can be kind of intimidating and still be a hero. This water level is actually the only one that doesn't have unguard, so therefore it will be the longest, which allows us to get to the good part of aquatic ambience. And the entire focus of this one is uh, outswimming the Croctopus, which laterally is just fine because there's no real way to increase your swimming speed when you're swimming side to side. The way you increase your speed swimming up is you have to mash... Uh, I guess it's A. Yeah. I think it is. Uh, which is normally your ascend button while also holding the up button. You can mash, like, your finger off. But if you're not holding the up button, the croctopus will catch you. So, you need to do both. I remember, uh, well, I, wouldn't, I didn't really play this as a kid, but there are a lot of examples of being chased in the Donkey Kong Country trilogy. And I don't really like being chased in video games, so you can imagine how I felt at the time. You think maybe that would have also influenced the Crash? I mean, I know Crash was Sonic's butt game, but there's a lot of chasing animals in Donkey Kong. What's going on with Diddy there? It's like the bubbles were going crazy around him. That is from me mashing a whole lot. When you see like some bubbles coming out of his head, that is an indicator that I was that I tapped the A button. Shouldn't really need to say this, but don't worry about running out of like oxygen and the like. The Kongs can breathe indefinitely for some reason. This must, this water must be really pure. Yeah, they are uh, magic monkeys. They are magic rolly monkeys. <laughs> He's wearing a baseball cap, mate. He must be some kind of magician. The Tai clearly has an oxygen tank attached to it. It's like a Shengong Wu. Uh -huh. it, it's the 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 Tai of. Poseidon or something. Yeah, you, you know exactly what series or cartoon to bring up to tickle my fancy, mate. <laughs> well, we're playing a game from the 90s. It's already a pretty nostalgic playthrough. Might as well go all out. Well, you know, Shaolin Showdown was 2000s, mate. Don't get it twisted. Yeah, but it's still nostalgia. <laughs> fair enough, mate. Fair enough. And here's your way to avoid this room of, I believe they're called squidges, is just hug the ceiling and you're good. Yeah, that's a bit of a pro tip for any aquatic ambient style level, really. All right, Cranky, take it to the fridge. Uh, what, what's the fanciness? We're going this way. All right, Ropey Rampage, that was the second level two parts ago. This is actually new, and something that is actually pretty difficult to do, just casually, is balancing eight times on an enemy. I've never done it. I don't plan on ever doing it, because I get plenty of lives just playing the game. You're gonna notice some weird slowdown with this level. That's not my recording. That is not whatever programs I was using. That is a legitimate slowdown within the system. If you play this game on an SNES, you get that slowdown. This is Squawks, by the way. He will uh, actually appear in the second game as a proper animal buddy, not just some kind of glorified flying torchlight. In a one time, so he is the definition of a gimmick. Also, if you change directions, Squawk 
it sort of gives the illusion that he is 3D. It flashes the light in your eye because, you know, he's turning towards you yeah. or turning away from you. So I try to minimize, you know, changing direction this level just because uh, even if you don't have seizures, flashing lights are just annoying as fuck. Yeah, it's pretty... Oof. I, I really don't like these specific types of of bonus rooms where you have these uh, clamp enemies which you cannot roll into for obvious reasons so you gotta bounce on them and you gotta bounce on them multiple times they increasingly get faster they do mix it up and make them better but like this one in particular is kind of dumb and redundant <laughs> like the only thing you have is the tire right there which okay thank you I, I don't know what how that how's that supposed to help me yeah just slam on slam on down onto him from like a great high and blow his brains out that probably is what's there for. That's probably a gameplay mechanic I don't know about. See you in the second game, Squawks, I guess. Yeah, bye bye. No need to go to Funky Kong. Funky Kong's whole reason is just to let you go back to old levels. Because if you notice, when you get to the first zone, or <laughs> yeah, first level of a world, uh -huh. I don't even know what the terms are. When you get there, you can't backtrack, you can only go where there are dotted lines. And I love how when you interview Stamper and a lot of the developers and you ask and when they're given the question, what do you regret? Or if you could, you know, update Donkey Kong Country, what would be the thing that you would? When you do that to modern developers, there's like a million things that they say. But when you talk to Rare, their one thing is that on the maps, the paths that the Kongs walk through to get from level to level, they were supposed to accurately follow the paths. But due to a time constraint, they instead just walk on the straight lines along the dots. Which, that's such a minute thing, and for that to be the big thing, that's crazy. It just shows how efficiently they worked and how much they valued getting their original vision done, you know, first. Instead of just getting the bare minimum. Although I have to say, it smacks a bit of excess, and you can see, like, the emerging thoughts of the Rare who created Donkey Kong 64 in those kind of statements. Yeah, and you can get that from this first game. I know a lot of people are like, oh, Donkey Kong 64 started the collect-a-thon. It's like, look at this game. It is a collect-a-thon of bonus rooms. Yep, yep. And now we get our first instance of a repeating boss. Even Cranky Kong himself within the game says that, wow, are we using bosses already? Just like the good old days. Yeah, Rare has a lot of great British nudge nudge wink wink, know what I mean, kind of, uh, I, I would say meta humor. Yeah, and then they kind of throw that out the window when they did Conquer. Mm. Not really a fan of Conquer, too crass for my liking, but uh, well, neither here nor there. We'll see you guys next time for the next part of Donkey Kong Country. Bye bye for now.